adventure that's out of this world. An Idaho artist transforms raw wood into functional works of art, and an old-fashioned celebration keeps alive the true meaning of Christmas. Hello and welcome to Exploring Idaho. I'm Dee Sarton along with Jennifer Eisenhart. And as you can see, the holiday season is upon us. That means lots of time with family, presents, and of course the kids have a long vacation from school. But before they shoved off for the holidays this year, some small town kids from Shoshone got a present that's out of this world. And really appropriate because I think just about every youngster would love to travel in space. Yeah, and for the holidays this year, they got their big chance. The small town of Shoshone, Idaho, is a quiet western community. It's a proud town, as American as the Pledge of Allegiance, recited every morning by the kids at Lincoln Elementary. Good morning, class. Good morning, Mrs. Boyan. But these few Shoshone third graders are not limited by their small town upbringing. In fact, their education goes far beyond the boundaries of the town, the state, the country, even the world. These kids are reaching for the stars. We spent about six weeks, seven weeks, studying the solar system and how it fits into the universe. This is the sun and the earth, how it moves around it. They begin with hands-on projects that unravel the mystery of moonlight. Paper plate sundials show how it's the earth that rotates, not the sun, and a simple piece of string attached to a small styrofoam ball explains a theory of planetary orbit. And then Mercury, it's really close, so it will go really fast and stuff. They've sketched every planet from Mercury to Pluto. Jupiter has rings and is made out of gas. The simple projects help explain some pretty complex subjects, but the best lessons come from experience. So today, teacher Kathy Boyan will do something quite extraordinary. She's taking her entire class on a field trip to outer space. Oh, it just makes it come alive. Luckily for the kids, outer space is only about a half hour's drive from Shoshone. And I'd like to thank you for coming to see us today at the Faulkner Planetarium and the Herod Center for Arts and Science. The Faulkner Planetarium in Twin Falls opened late last year. Ever since, its programs have put Idaho school children among the stars. It's like a movie theater, but better. Reclining seats comfort the virtual astronauts as they prepare to blast off on a 45-minute simulated space odyssey that leaves every textbook in the dust. Get your goggles, Elmo. Looks like another job for... The Planet Patrol. Patrol. Technology can just really make things so much more dynamic and um, very visual for the children. Photographs from the Hubble telescope fly out of space onto the planetarium dome. Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system and bears some resemblance to Jupiter in both structure and composition. Uranus gives off very little heat. A computerized star ball blasts through the known reaches of space while a series of 49 slide projectors adds images of planets, spaceships, and aliens. In the sunshine, the temperature here on the moon is only 260 degrees above zero. Not only entertained, I think they were enthralled. I think they were in awe of, of, of the technology, of, of the whole presentation of the show. It looked like just like there was no roof on the, on the walls and stuff, and it looked like we were just going through space. A big lesson for a group of small town kids, but these are not the first young Idahoans to explore the outer limits. The legacy of simulated space travel in Twin Falls can be traced back to the 1950s. It leads to one man, shop teacher Norman Harrett. At a workbench in the basement of his house, Norman Harrett constructed from scratch Idaho's first planetarium. This is the original uh, star projector that Norman Harrett built. He started on it in the 1950s and kept adding to it over the years. Virtually nothing was bought new and he took it on himself as a, a mission to find an old piece of equipment and find a way for it to, to serve something useful. Piece by piece, Harrett assembled the galaxy. This is an old can. Uh, this is the top of something who knows what. 
the lamps, the lenses were all um, out of old World War I and World War II bomb sites. The motors to run things were from old sewing machines, uh, old clock motors that he took out of old broken clocks. This is the window crank out of an old car. And he would crank it up and down at the appropriate time. It's just a wonderful thing. Museum director Jim Woods remembers those days. Jim was a young student when Norman Herrett began teaching the children of a simple farming community the complex theories of the universe. The kids were captivated, and those lessons changed lives. We have one that became a senator, one that's chairman of a physics department at a big university, a doctor, a chemist, an astronomer. Proof that an active education with lessons that involve kids can positively shape the future. If Norman could do that with this, what should we be able to do with that? With a lot more kids and a lot more technology, we should really be able to excite kids. There are great gaseous nebulous quasars, objects we are only now beginning to explore, and some we haven't even discovered yet, and they're all a challenge. It sure broadens their world, you know, from being in a little town, you know, like Shoshone, to thinking of the universe and all the galaxies and the numbers of them. It's, it's, it's really mind-boggling, but when we do some of these experiences, ex experiments that we've done and some of the projects we've done, it just broadens their thinking. And who knows, the small town kids of today could become the space explorers of tomorrow. It was cool. The Faulkner Planetarium and Herrett Center for Arts and Sciences has programs that run year-round, and they even have a special Christmas program that runs during the holidays. Are they all designed for kids? No, they have many uh, programs for adults, and when you're in there, it just really feels like you're in outer space. It looks like it. Jim, thank you. Right. Exploring Idaho will be right back. Still ahead, a Boise man turns his hobby into an art form. We'll show you his amazing work when Exploring Idaho returns. If it's taken care of, it will last indefinitely. If you're looking for the perfect gift for the outdoorsman in your family, then look no further. A Boise man has perfected the art of handcrafted hunting bows. And you don't have to be a hunter to appreciate the beauty of these age-old wooden weapons. The man who makes them wouldn't have it any other way. Archery. Archery got me started building bows. I kind of have been working with wood almost all my life, and uh, been in archery about the same. Bow hunter Nick Neidegger has developed a passion for every facet of archery. It began with a love of hunting in the field, and developed into a consuming hobby that led him into the business of building handmade bows. The thing that's most appealing to me about the traditional style equipment is simplicity. The whole world is hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. and. Uh, high power this and high power that. And when you grab a hold of one of these things and step out into the field, um, it's like changing times. The basic design of a longbow is hundreds of years old. In medieval times, this particular style of bow was the most efficient and deadliest weapon in a distinct age of archery. The English longbow came into its own as a formidable weapon in the 13th century during the ongoing conflict between the French and the English known as the 100 Years War. Perhaps the most famous encounter was the Battle of Agincourt, forever immortalized by William Shakespeare in his play, Henry V. In the old days, you had two choices. You either made your own bow or you went and saw a boyer. Today, Nick has become his own boyer creating traditional longbows from raw materials. It starts with a variety of different kinds of woods from all over the world. The exotic imported woods have equally exotic names. Ziracati, kingwood, bloodwood, zebra wood. This is another piece of kingwood, purple heart, piece of mesquite with a little bit of purple heart uh, joined into it, bobinga, zebra wood, and bacati. Nick begins by shaping the raw pieces into long, thin strips. There's two things that are really fun about working with the wood. Number one is it's breathing new life into this wood. And uh, what's really neat about it is when you get done, there's something tangible there. 
It has beauty and it will last a long time. Forming the riser is the next step. The riser is the center part of the bow, the grip, where the arrow rests. From there, it gets set right into the bow, one piece construction, and uh, it uh, then gets shaped as a component of the bow. I actually spend quite a bit of time out here building away on the bows. It is definitely more than a business. Um, to build a bow and have it not only be beautiful, but be functional is, to me, the, it's, it's a great reward. It's the reward that I get out of doing it. This attitude is easy to understand when you consider the time and patience that goes into each step of the process. Now, Nick will join multiple layers of wood strips with glue. Stack that one in there. It's real important that every surface that touches gets glue. You can't just glue one side and then stick it together. It's got to be every single surface has to have a coat of glue put on it. This is one of those hobbies that you definitely can't get in a hurry on. If you get in a hurry, um, you uh, put all of the labor you put into something at risk. Slow and steady wins the race doing this. The clear epoxy provides a preview of how the finished wood will look. So once we get everything all lined up right here, we're just going to pick this thing up, head for the press. The, the press like is a contraption Nick designed to hold all the parts together as the glue is drying. The riser is placed in the center of the bow, and the whole works is clamped together with bolts. Then air is pumped into a fire hose that runs the entire length of the press. You can hear a little creaking going on. We are now ready to put this in an oven. The bow will cook for six hours in this heat box to set the glue. Out of the box, you can see the hint of the eventual shape of an English longbow. But there are still hours of sanding and shaping before it becomes a polished product that this craftsman can point to with pride. You spend a lot of time with them in your hands. And uh, some of them are a little obstinate. Some of them are real cooperative as far as getting done. Um, they definitely have their own personality. Sometimes it's uh, rather difficult to uh, let them go. Nick estimates he invests about 40 hours into crafting each of his bows. But for this bow hunter, it is time well spent. Because when hunting season rolls around each fall, you can bet one of these beauties will be his constant companion as he ranges through the mountains and deserts of Idaho. Things go back to simple elements. There's nothing here but some wood and a piece of string, and uh, you get to make what you can make of it as far as recreation. It takes Nick several months to craft each bow, so if you have plans to order one, prepare to be patient. Later in the show, we'll tell you how to contact Nick for more information. The spirit of giving and sharing makes this Christmas season a wonderful time of year. But sometimes in the rush to buy all the presents and prepare for the big morning, we lose sight of that spirit. That's why some special people at Mountain River Ranch in eastern Idaho have taken it upon themselves to show all of us how to have some good old-fashioned fun during the holiday season. The last rays of sun slowly disappear over the horizon, and darkness will soon follow. But the silence of this snowy night will soon be broken by the sound of laughter, music, and sleigh bells. These cowboys are getting everything ready for a special evening. They're putting on an old-fashioned Christmas, Western style. It's exciting. And this is the best part of it, as far as I'm concerned, the worst part. Tran King used to be a corporate executive for Boise Cascade but he fell in love with the country life of eastern Idaho. So nine years ago, he started horse and sleigh rides on the ranch he bought along the Snake River. The rides are now one of the highlights of a magical evening in the country. It all starts back at the ranch's own frontier town of Rock Bottom Springs. 
people like it. It's unique, and uh, we don't go for a long ride. We just go long enough where they get to see the big horses and they hear the bells and hear the double trees clanging in the wood and the metal and all that, and uh, it's exciting for people. Passing through the snow, we're on horse open sleigh. O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. With a little coaxing, it doesn't take long before everyone is singing at the top of their lungs. Oh, what fun it is to ride a horse and horse and sleigh. <laughs> young or just young at heart, all enjoy the snowy night and cheerful songs. Won't you guide my sleigh tonight? The Christmas carols and nippy weather set the mood for more music and a hot meal. But who gets to eat first may depend on how well you sing. It could be killing the stampede. So what we're going to do, my favorite part, we're going to have a singing contest. Yay! Your charge is... Christine King is living a dream. She's Tran's wife and partner here at the ranch. Christine's been performing on stage since she was old enough to talk, and her enthusiasm is contagious. I love what I'm doing, and if people see that, then most of the time they're going to have a good time too. With a little prompting from Christine, the rest of the group can't help but get involved. Now, you're good guys, though. You're good guys. You're good guys. When you get them up there, they're just having fun. They're playing. We're playing is what we're doing, you know? Um, give them a couple toys, and people do things that they wouldn't do before. He's a their family, their friends, the rest of the company, they get to see them in a way that they haven't seen them before. Well, that's Joe up there on stage in a cowboy hat. You know, I see him at work every day in a three-piece suit and a tie, you know. And people get a kick out of that. Laughter and singing drift into the night. It's the sound of friends and neighbors. Oh, These traditional songs are an inspiration for Dave Sheldahl. He's an elementary school principal during the day, but gladly travels 20 miles every night to these sing-alongs at the ranch. If you don't have the Christmas spirit, you come out here and we'll give it to you. That's what we're after. Make people go home and feel good about being here. Okay, now watch this. Lois, would you just blow in that a little bit? All right. <laughs> In our busy lives, it's easy to forget what Christmas is all about. But the friendly folks at Mountain River Ranch help us remember. They remind us that the spirit of love and laughter is something we can share all year long. Oh my gosh, I hope. This time of year, the season is we're making Christmas for people. And you, um, I feel as if you're getting people back in touch with something that they forget about with all the craziness that's going on in their lives just like it is here. All the hustle and bustle and the running around. It makes people stop and go, oh, this is really fun. And, and with just your friends or family and we sing and do all those, those old fun things that people don't do anymore. And that's a wonderful feeling. May your Nice 
job. Give yourself a big hand. Now that gets you in the mood, doesn't it? The variety show lasts through February, then moves out to the frontier town, where you just might find yourself in the middle of a shootout, so be careful. While we're speaking of the West, do you know which famous old Western character lived for several years in North Idaho? In the 1880s, he and his brother ran a saloon for a few years in the town of Murray, but they were better known for skills as gunfighters. We'll have the answer to this Idaho puzzler when Exploring Idaho returns. Could you name the wild western gunfighter who made his home in North Idaho? In the early 1880s, Wyatt Earp, along with his brother Virgil, operated the Earp Brothers White Elephant Saloon in Murray. They only stayed in town for about a year and a half, maybe because the town of Tombstone, Arizona, was calling their names. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you've seen in our show today, call for a copy of the Exploring Idaho Field Notes. Be sure to ask for show number 142. We wish you and your family a Merry Christmas, and we'll see you again next time on Exploring Idaho.